Dr. McGee, I'm making videos, so I don't have to write any commentaries. But I have an outline commentary right there, you know. A little half and half there, you know. But yes, if you would, open up your Bibles to John chapter 2, please. John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Let's go ahead and ask the Lord for help this evening before we get into our uh, expository study here, amen. Um, Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening, Lord. Thank you for this chance for us to come together this Resurrection Sunday to learn more about thee in that word. And Father, I just ask that you fill us with the Holy Ghost. You'll be able to illuminate us and teach us with regards to the items that uh, you actually did here in John chapter 2. And Father, we give you thanks and praise for all things, especially turning water into wine for the salvation that you brought through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And let's go ahead and continue our expository study here in the Gospel of John. Okay. And we saw that John is actually showing Jesus Christ as the Son of Man because he does want to involve himself with our everyday activities. He wants to be part of our lives. And we're seeing that here as we looked at the wedding in Cana. Okay. But we took a detour last time we discussed this and talked about wine for a while. So it should be clear we're talking about grape juice. And we're also talking about getting gladness and joy from the Lord. That is the focus here. So now we're going to look at this miracle a little more in depth and see the pictures that the Lord can expose to us from the words in Scripture. Amen. Okay. So let's go ahead and read John chapter 2, please. We're going to go ahead and read verses 1 through 4. And before I get into these pictures, I'm probably going to expose these prior verses here so we can discuss them. The Bible says, And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And here we get this description of an interaction between the Lord and his mother, Mary. And I bet if you are somebody who loved to worship the Virgin Mary, this would kind of be a surprise to you. Okay? Woman, what have I to do with thee? You might be, wow, that's kind of brash for the Lord to say to his own mother. Okay, you won't catch me calling my mother a woman. Okay? You won't even catch my dad at times. He's smarter than that. But we're supposed to learn something from this here. Okay? So what is he trying to say with this phrase in verse 4? Woman, what have I to do with thee? What does that mean? Okay? What's going on there? Let's go to, uh, keep your finger here in John. Let's go to Luke chapter 2. Let's try to get some context here. Okay. Luke chapter 2. I'm going to go to verse 51, please. Okay. Verse 51. What happened here is the Lord's bar mitzvah occurred. And uh, I guess Mary and Joseph, they lost the Lord, so to speak. But he wasn't really lost. He was being about his father's business. Verse 49. And we're in verse 51, the Bible says, And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. So here the Lord now, he's subject to his parents. He honors his father and mother. Okay? He kept the law at every point. And notice, but his mother kept all these sayings in her heart because she thought about him saying, Was she not that I know it was about my father's business? And she should have realized, wait a minute, he's 12, he's under the law now. He's busy trying to keep what the will of his father at this point. Okay. Thinking about what happened with the angel, all these things. She kept these sayings in her heart. Verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And that's what the Lord was doing from when he was 12 all the way up to when he got baptized, water baptized by John the Baptist. Okay. And once he was manifested to Israel as their Messiah with that action, when they saw the Spirit of God descend like a dove onto Jesus Christ, and the Father spoke, saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Something changed there, okay? Now he's starting his mission as a prophet, as a preacher in the street, and he's following the will of his father now, and he's directly under his father at this point, okay? That subjection changed in a certain way right after that moment, okay? And so that now he's under this office of prophet, and he's fulfilling that through his ministry, okay? His mother's still his mother. But that relationship changed. Notice how his mother came to him and was trying to kind of tell him, hey, hey, they need wine. They're trying to hint to him that he should be doing things at this time. See? 
She's like, woman, what do I have to do with thee? This isn't the right moment. I will handle this. But she's trying to egg him on. She kind of knows who her son is a little bit. She has some idea here, okay? But he has to do things at the right moment, okay? It's kind of like Brother Eduardo. He always stumbles it at the perfect time, right? For prayer. There you go. Perfect moment. The Lord knows when it is. Amen? Okay? So that's why he says woman, okay? Now, what's interesting about this is a lot of people who worship Mary call her the virgin mother, right? Notice God didn't call her that. He's trying to help us. You see, the Lord knew 2,000 years ago that people were going to start getting weird and start worshiping his mother, okay? He's trying to help us out, all right? He's trying to get us to think, wait a minute. If Jesus Christ is calling her a woman, we should recognize where she is. Now, she's blessed, you know, blessed among women, definitely, no doubt. She is my sister in the Lord. I'm going to get to meet Mary one day, and so are the people here if you're saved. Okay? But she's not somebody that wants to be worshipped. You ask her, well, go look. you can go look at Luke 1 and see that she magnifies the Lord. You're supposed to be like her and do that. But most people are worshipping this figment of imagination, which is this Virgin Mary. Okay? That is not the Mary of Scripture. That is not the historical Mary at all. Okay? And the Lord's trying to clue us in. Uh, go to Matthew 12, please. Matthew 12 and verse 46. Let's look at some verses about these interactions between Jesus Christ and his mother. Okay. Matthew 12 and verse 46. Now, one other reason you can point out as well is the idea that the Godhead is male. Okay. God is male. So you should be worshiping a male God. He, he's not female. Okay. Matthew 12 and verse 46. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my mother and uh, my brother and sister and mother. So that's the key thing. That's the most important thing to the Lord Jesus Christ and to you Christians to do the will of the Father, the Heavenly Father, see? Amen. And part of that will is manifested here in this telling because it wasn't the exact moment that he had to go ahead and deal with the swine, okay? The Lord knows when it is. Mary's trying to get him to do it a little earlier, and that's like a slight little reproof from the Lord. That's, what, that's what's going on there, trying to help her, okay? Also, go to Luke 11, please. Luke 11. Now, it's very interesting how many religions have their version of the Virgin Mary in their history. You got the Madonnas out there, okay? You got your Isis. You got all these different things. Why do they all go together? How come the God of Scripture is a male? It doesn't seem to fit all those things, okay? The Lord tried to help us in the Gospel of John see that we shouldn't be worshiping Mary, and yet you see Catholics doing that as well. Okay? It's probably due to a lack of information. We should help them so they don't have to be ignorant of these realities. But hopefully they won't be offended in the Lord, but instead will consider why the Lord said the things he said. Okay? Luke 11 and verse 27. Verse 27, please, the Bible says, more interactions here. And it came to pass, he spake these things, as Jesus. A certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee in the past which thou hast sucked. That used to be uh, me as a Catholic. You know, my Virgin Mary. Okay? My grandmother, who we pray for, still does that a lot. Notice what Jesus says. But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. See that? Not just hear the word of God and let it come out the other ear. Okay? Hear the word of God and keep it. Okay? So let's see if we're going to hear the word. Let's go back to John 2. Okay? John chapter 2, please. Now notice the Lord in verse 4, he ended with, My hour is not yet come. Now this is interesting. Did you wonder what's going on here? You can take it in context and consider the reality that this isn't the right moment for him to do this miracle. You can say that. But it's a little deeper than that. Okay? There will be a time when Jesus Christ will be subject to men. There is an hour where this occurred. Okay? And he's kind of pointing to that in a doctrinal way. Let me give you an idea here. Uh, keep your finger here. Go to Luke 22. Okay? 
mine hour is not yet come. He, he will be subject to men for some time. Okay? And this ties right into uh, Resurrection Sunday because something happened just before the resurrection about three days prior. Luke 22 and verse 52, the Bible says. Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders, which were come to him. This happened at that evening right after he prayed. And they came with Judas to arrest him because he's apparently a rabble rouser. And they could have arrested him in the temple earlier. He, they didn't do anything like that because he only went about doing good. This, this doesn't make any sense. But they come after him with staves and all these things. Be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves. And notice the Lord trying to help them. What have I done? What do you need to come out like that? Okay, 53. When I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. See that? There will be a time where God will be subject to man for a certain time. And this was it. Leading up to Calvary. The power of darkness, the power of the devil, using men to get Jesus Christ to Calvary because he's all excited he's going to kill God. Okay? So I know God used that to triumph over him, right? First Corinthians 2. If he didn't, if he knew, if the princes of the world knew, he would have never done that. Too bad. He didn't pay attention to the Bible. That's why God could write down exactly what he was going to do, and he still got fooled. Praise the Lord. Okay? The Lord said what his Messiah was going to do to save his people from us. It's written in the scriptures, right? Okay? But the devil has no light. Okay? These people don't have any light. And in this power of darkness moment, the Lord by his permissive will, allow these people to do what they did, all right? Okay. There is a moment he'd be subject to men. So think back to the woman. Woman, what have I to do with thee? There will be a moment where he will be subject to men and women. It's here. That's what he was pointing out in that statement as well. Okay? As we know, the Lord is one of the greatest editors in existence. He can fit so much in a tiny space. Okay? He can say one phrase and it can have four different meanings. It's unbelievable. And they all fit the context. Crazy stuff. Okay? Praise the Lord. Go back to John 2. Go back to John 2. Let's keep that in mind. Okay. So there's a lot there. And Lord wasn't saying that to offend his mother. Okay, He's just trying to help his mother. Slight, tiny little reproof there. Okay. Verse 5, the Bible says, His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And here we have the only command that the Virgin Mother Mary ever gave. See that? Why do I mention this? Well, you got a lot of people who claim to follow her. To say, did you know that she said she gave a command? See that? Did you know that? Really? Let me see that. You take him to John 2, verse 5. Whatsoever he, talking about Jesus, saith unto you, do it. You know what he said? Go back, go to John 3 and verse 7. Let's go right there. Marvel not, I say unto thee, ye must be born again. You need to get born again, see that? There's a gospel link right there. There's your Romans road in John 2 and 3, okay, if you want one. Mary's road. Yeah. You should have a road with any person in Scripture, really. You should be able to find a way to get to get them to Jesus from wherever in the Bible. Right? Yeah. And you can use that. I've done that to my grandmother. And she didn't know what to say. <laughs> I, I was hoping she'd listen, but she just kind of froze a little bit and went back to talking to stuff. And we understand we keep praying for her. Praise the Lord. Okay. But yes, Mary did give a command. It's a great command. You need to do what Jesus said. Amen. Okay. Verse 6. Verse 6. I'm going to go ahead and read verses 6 through 11. We're going to look at this miracle that occurred here, which was turning water into wine. And after we read these, I'm going to go ahead and expose them. And verse 6, the Bible says, And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, they knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and one man have well drunk, than that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles, disproving the other Bible right there, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. So here we have the first miracle noted in the Gospel of John. The first miracle the Lord did in his ministry, actually. 
turning water into wine. And there's actually four applications that you can pull out of this, this miracle. We're just going to discuss three today. Okay. First one would be a historical reference. Okay. So you can connect this to the Jews. You can connect this to Israel. Because they are a woman in the eyes of God. It's a woman that he's going to marry. And this happened at a marriage feast. And he wants to provide them something. Amen. Let me show you some verses. Go to Isaiah 62 and verse 4. I don't think I wrote it up there. I apologize. Isaiah 62 and verse 4. Let's see some references to Israel as a bride here. Okay. Isaiah 62 and verse 4, the Bible says. And this is their future. Okay. So this is history written ahead of time. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shalt thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hezbollah and thy land Beulah, for the Lord delighted in thee, and thy land shall be married. So you see that reference tied to Israel. They're going to be called these names. Okay. Uh, Hezbollah, I believe it means my delight is in her, and Beulah, married. So we sing Beulah land, Beulah land, we're talking about the married land, because we're going to get married too. We'll, we'll, we'll get to us. We'll get to that. Let's focus on Israel right now. Historical reference. Okay. And you can look at this entire miracle and discover the reality that, yes, the Jews kind of messed up because they got, they kind of lost God in their religion. Okay. That's why these water pots didn't have any water, see? They were missing something, okay? Isn't it weird that you're at a marriage feast and there's no wine to drink? Okay, what are you talking about? Alcoholic wine went over this, grape juice. There was nothing to drink, huh? And that's true for Judaism, okay? Over the course of their history through the Old Testament, they got to a point where they didn't have any wine, so to speak. They lost God. They lost sight of him to the point where his glory left the temple. Okay, for a while. Now it's interesting because the reason for that is because their traditions took precedence over the Word of God. Okay? Kind of sounds like Christianity today, doesn't it? Christendom at large okay, has the same problem. Traditions take more importance over than the Scripture, and that's why you can't find God in them at all either. See? So Israel is a great type of Christendom at large. Okay? There's people who call themselves Christian, your JWs, your Mormons, your, your cat, all those things. Okay? Same issue. They left the Bible, and that's why they have no water in their pot, so to speak. See? It's very interesting how that works. And because they trusted in these ceremonies, they trusted in these rituals, they trusted in these things and lost sight of God, they had no function spiritually to them. It didn't help them at all. Okay? Now, the same can be true for you, Christian. We have a few ordinances, right? Let's say you did the Lord's Supper and you didn't mean it here. You weren't looking for God in the Lord's Supper. Okay? I'm sure Passover probably happened last Wednesday here at the local church. Okay? And I wasn't around. But, okay, if you were doing that and your heart wasn't in it, it has no meaning. It's useless. Okay? That, that hasn't changed. And yet you'll find many Christians going through the rigmarole, and roll, going through that same thing. Okay? When I was quote unquote Catholic, a Christian, I went through that Rick and Rose since I got communion, I received communion for the first time. Okay? Never really meant anything. Because I didn't have God. See? Okay. Now the worst thing about it is you're at this marriage feast in Cana, right? The water pots aren't full, they're they're missing, they need wine, right? And the Messiah of the Jews is right there in the feast and they can't they don't even know who he is. Do you know something? Okay? He's lost in the mix. So not only do they not know the Lord in the Old Testament, they don't know the Messiah in the New. Okay, John 1, we went over this. He came into his own. Right? His own received him. They didn't know him. Can't see him. Okay. <laughs> and that continues today. Because the Spirit of Christ continues to work with them, and many of them do not see their Messiah. It's a very sad thing. Okay. Now, we hope... You know, we pray for them. So we were just praying for the peace of Jerusalem. We want them to see their Messiah. It'd be a blessing if they do, because one thing I can tell you, okay, if a Jew gets saved, they're going to serve. Okay? They seem really good about that. Okay? If any of you know Jewish brethren, you've seen them. They get, they get really hardcore, so to speak, serving the Lord. Praise God for that. We need good examples like that. Okay? But if they accepted their king, 
they would actually receive the wine of gladness. They would be, they were able to get some joy. Okay? And I'm glad, if you go back to Isaiah 62, okay, we'll read verse 5. You're going to see that in the future this will happen. It's a blessing to know that this will be fulfilled. Okay, it was the third day, it said in John 2 verse 1. That was the third day after four days. Okay, we kind of went over this. The seventh day in the millennium, see that, 7,000th year right there, they will be married, right? See all that stuff kind of fits together? It's kind of, isn't that interesting how the Bible does that? Okay, kind of shows you that I didn't write it. Okay, I'm not that clever, but God is. Okay, Isaiah 62 and verse 5. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. And God's going to rejoice over them, and they're going to rejoice over their God when they get married in the millennium. Praise God. Okay? So you can see that historical application there. Now let's get to the ones that we like, the spiritual applications. Right? I'm going to give you two this evening. Okay? The first one you can see, and it's probably the most obvious, is this is a picture of somebody receiving Jesus Christ as their Savior. Somebody getting saved, right? Okay. And you can say this applies mostly to like the Gentiles or in general people that are lost and don't know Jesus Christ, but predominantly us. Okay. Because the Lord, right, the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. That's what he came to do. Okay. Let's go back to verse 3. Let me piece this out for you. John chapter 2 and verse 3. Let's see. Verse 3. And when they wanted wine. If you want wine, it's because you're thirsty, right? See that? Thirst. Okay? And people who are lost, they tend to have spiritual thirst when they start seeking God, right? See that? Okay. Now, what's funny is lost people, when they're looking for God, and I can relate to this because this was me for a while, okay? You kind of look wherever you can, and you don't really know where you're going, but you're thirsty. You're trying to find God when God brings that conviction down, okay? Because you realize that you're empty in your heart. You realize you have emptiness in your soul, and you need to get that filled. And you kind of understand, at least a little bit, that only the actual being that exists can fill that, right? Okay? And so you're spiritually thirsty, so to speak. Okay? And so you search. Sometimes you might get lost in the temporal pleasures of sin, right? And those will give you some temporary happiness or whatnot, but they'll never give you that full joy. They'll never actually fill your heart. Huh? It's kind of happened with me. Got lost in the club, so to speak. That wasn't enough. That didn't actually fill my soul. I needed Jesus Christ. Huh? That joy, that happiness that those things can give you will end, but the joy that the Lord gives you will fill you to the uttermost, you see? And then you go to verse 6. Go to verse 6. Bible says, and there were set there six water pots of stone. What do these represent? Well, for those who studied Bible numbers, six is the number of man. You know that. Keep your finger there. Go to Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36. Let's get some clarity on the stones here. So we got men. Ezekiel 36 and verse 26. The Bible says, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. See that? And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. See that? So those water parts aren't stoned by accident now, okay? They represent something. And you can see it represents the heart of a lost man. It's kind of stony. It's kind of hard. God's got to soften it up. Thinking about Luke 8 now? Thinking about Matthew 13, the parable of the sword? See how all that stuff fits together? Okay. So you have this picture. you got lost man there. Okay. And it's pretty hard and it's empty. See that? Hard to crack and there's nothing in it. Very interesting. Okay. That's lost people. All right. Now keep that in mind. Go to 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4. And do a comparison here. Okay, that's a lost man. What about a saved person? Okay. Second Corinthians 4 and verse 7, the Bible says, we'll go to verse 6 actually, I'll read both. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. Okay, he filled them up. 
to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Look at it in your heart, brother. That's where the Lord resides. The Holy Ghost is shed abroad in your hearts. Okay? That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You see that? Okay? So your, your water pot isn't stony. Okay? It's soft. Okay? It can be molded by the potter and shaped in the proper manner. You see? And God filled it up with the wine of gladness, a.k.a. The Spirit of God. But that's not the case here. God had to perform a work right in this miracle. See that? Okay. And so the difference between a person who knows God and the one that does not is right there, pictured for you in a way you can understand. Okay. Notice that. When the water pots aren't full and their heart is stone, the people there, they're not recognizing who's doing this work. But all of a sudden, after they get fooled and they see the results of it, they're asking, you know, who gave this, this, this new wine? Who gave this good wine? Who, who provided that? Suddenly, God is manifested in the wake. See that? You can start seeing him. Go back to John chapter uh, 2. We're not done yet. John chapter 2. We got to flesh out the whole picture. That's what Pastor Stone said here. John chapter 2 and verse 7, the Bible says, okay, fill the water pots with water. What does water represent? Well, we know it represents the word of God, doesn't it? Okay. Let's go to the Old Testament. Everybody knows the New Testament reference here. Go to Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32. You guys know Ephesians 5, right? Cleansed by the water of the word. Okay. Go to Deuteronomy 32. Let me show you one in the Old Testament. Because it's the same God. It shouldn't surprise us. Okay. That he would talk about this in both Testaments. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 1, the Bible says. Give your all ye heavens and I will speak. That's God. Okay. And hear, O earth, that's us, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, that's water. My speech shall distill as the dew, as a small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass, because men are as grass, right? That's what flesh is. And God had to bring his word down over time, lightly, slowly, you see that? Progressively, and that's why it took about 1,600 years to give us this Bible. See that? Water. Okay, And so he's trying to get us to see that we need to fill our water pot of stone with the word of God. And that might result in a change. Right. Don't fill it with philosophy and vain deceit. Don't fill it with the stuff we're talking about in Sunday school. Don't do that. All right. That is religions of man. Those thoughts of man aren't going to do anything but make it harder. And they're going to leak and crack the water pot. And it's going to leak out the side. Right. You need to fill it with God. So you need to fill it with his word. Are you filling it with his word? Now, here's what's interesting. Okay. Who? Okay. Who did this miracle? Okay. Well, Jesus, man, he obviously. But he told servants, right? To do this work for him. But notice, Jesus is the one who did it. Now, why do I point this out? Okay. Because part of the act of witnessing, part of being a Christian is when you serve God by doing what he tells you, right? And sometimes we lose sight of this reality and we think we can make that water turn into wine. We can't do that. That's God's work. See that? Don't try to add accidental leaven to the gospel. Focus on giving people the truth of God and trust God to work on their hearts. Okay? Be there. Be always ready to give an answer. Okay? Be willing to help these people. Like, we, we get that. Okay? But we need to let God convert them because when he does, it's forever. Okay? There will be a serious change, okay? So he was talking about repentance. Pastor said it's a change of mind, amen. It's also a change of heart. That's why it results in an action, okay? They never escape. Oh, I, I prayed a prayer and you've been living like the devil for how long? Okay? Of course I'm going to be questioning your salvation. That's very weird, okay? It's almost like God, you didn't get touched by God, so to speak. Okay, did he actually fill your water pot? That would have an effect, okay? It affected the people in that wedding, okay? Go back to John, please. Go back to John chapter 2. Okay. Now, the most interesting thing is they filled those water pots up to the brim, right? But they stayed water. It wasn't until the servants came and served people as they were taking out the cup and they were putting it in the glass. That's when they started changing into wine. Isn't that interesting? Why, why did God wait in that manner? He's trying to show us something. He's trying to get us to think. Okay. 
Salvation comes through that action. Okay? He's trying to pass his water to others. We're supposed to be the ones passing the water so that when it gets into their cup and it overflows, Psalm 23, okay, they get that joy of salvation. See that? Okay, let me show you an example. Go to Acts chapter 8. Okay. Go to Acts chapter 8. Here's an example of somebody getting filled with water. Okay. We we'll notice the difference between when the water is getting filled on its own and when a Christian is involved in the action. Okay. This is we're supposed to help. Okay. Acts 8 and verse 26, the Bible says. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south into the way that goeth down from Jerusalem and Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Cadence, queen of the Ethiopians, or Candace, but sorry about that, who had the charge of all their treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. So you have this eunuch, he's actually getting some water here. Okay. He's He's partaking in some way. He's trying to fill his water pot. Okay? Now he's filling it, but we're going to see there's some confusion. Go to verse 30. Okay? And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come and sit with him. See how necessary it is for that Christian to be the one to take that water out and pour it in their cup. See, God has a way, okay? He doesn't tell us these things for no reason. He wants us involved, okay? He will find a way to do this. In this case, for this eunuch, God literally took Philip, okay? <laughs> he went by the Spirit over there, praise God, okay? You might go to the Spirit over to Kroger's, I don't know, okay? You go to Wegmans, you just happen to run into somebody. Oh, I heard, you go to that Bible church, right? I was confused about something. There you go. It's time for you to administer that water so it can change into wine, possibly, here. Okay, sometimes we have to be the ones to give the interpretation because we have the Spirit of God. They do not. Does that make sense? See that? You understand the things of God. The lost person does not. So they, God's going to guide them to you to give the truth. See how that works? Okay. Verse 35. Now, what was the interpretation thereof? Very simple. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. He preached the person who changes the water into wine. See that? Okay. In the end, it's Jesus who really does that work. It's God who does that work. It's God that gives the increase. Okay. Don't lose sight of that, Christian, because once you think it's about you, you already fell. That's it. Okay. You already, you're already a Corinthian. Congratulations. Okay. Don't lose sight of who you serve and why you serve him to serve others. That is the cross-centered life. Okay. That's joy, right? Jesus first, others next, you last. You've heard that preached. That's not a joke, by the way. That's actually the reality of the Christian life. Okay. Now, what's sad is what we saw, we see people looking for traditions. Okay? They're looking for Mary. They're looking at all these things, but they need to find Jesus. Okay? He's the one they need. He's the one that can change that water into wine. And hopefully, you can be one of those servants to be part of that. Okay? Because they don't have to be stuck blind at that wedding. You can give them light. Okay? And so that ties into the second picture, which is us serving God. See that? It's the second spiritual picture here. Now, who gave the command to fill those pots? Okay? Well, Jesus did. And Jesus told who? The servants. Are you a servant of God? That's you. See that? You're there. You see yourself? Okay. Go back to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. But notice, it's God who gives the commands. God is telling you directly what to do. You don't need a middleman necessarily. Okay? Now, by extension, the word of God is God talking to you. Right? But this is what's this is what's happened in my generation. Give me an example. Oh, I got saved. Praise God. I got born again. Okay, I want to serve God. I'm growing. I'm trying to learn something here. I start reading my Bible. Start growing. Next thing you know, oh, I want to serve God. Somebody tells me I need to go to a Bible college. I need to go to university today. I'm talking about in my generation, not in the past. Yeah. And it's over there you get taught, you get trained out of listening to Jesus Christ directly. Okay. 
That's not good. Now, thank God there's still Bible Baptist churches out there that'll get you back to Jesus, okay? That'll focus on Jesus, that you hear from Jesus in the Word of God. And they exist. But don't be duped, okay? It's not going to work. You're not going to grow. You're not going to serve God properly if you get lost in some of these universities that teach that the Word of God is something you can't have, that isn't current, that you can't hold in your hand, that you can't follow it. You don't know, but I know. You got to come to me. I got to translate it for you. Okay? I got to interpret the Bible for you. No, the scripture is of no private interpretation. What are you talking about? Did we just forget this verse because he got a PhD? That doesn't make any sense to me. Okay? You're supposed to be the one who knows that verse and avoids breaking it. Okay? Sure. This is why you don't see many Bible believers today that are my age. This is what has happened. Now, thank God that wasn't the case in the past, but America's just gotten worse. It's going to be fine. Okay? America has went down in the dumps since they threw God out of school. Okay? And that was way before I was born. Anyways, John chapter 2 and verse 9. John chapter 2 and verse 9. Now, what we're going to do is uh, jump to that parenthesis. This is interesting. The parenthesis that says, but the servants which drew the water knew. Talking about how the ruler of the feast, because he's, he's got that water pot of stone. He's trying to figure this out. But the servant is somebody who knows who did the work. You know Jesus, right? So you know who was involved in changing that water into wine. You see that? Okay. And because of that knowledge, you have more understanding than that ruler of the feast. You have more understanding than the person who's supposed to preside over these things. The religious leader, the king of the crop, so to speak. As a Christian, you knew more than all these people. Okay, once you got saved, you knew more than the Catholic priest. You knew more than the Catholic bishop. You knew more than the Catholic cardinal. And you know more than the Catholic pope. Congratulations. Okay. That can't be yes, because you know God. Very simple. You have a personal relationship with God. That's automatic. He does it. So he's, he's wandering in darkness. His water pot is still stony, and I'm guessing in the Pope's case, it's pretty musty and dirty, okay? I think it's probably got patches in it on the sides with all the water that's bursted out of that nasty water, okay? But he doesn't have God. He doesn't know, but you do, okay? So you gotta be careful. You gotta be careful of those who profess to be wise. They turn out to be fools. You gotta think about these realities and understand that you know God, and so you need to follow God's guidance in the word of God. Just like these servants. And you will end up knowing more. As you witness more and more and you start seeing God work through your life with others. Okay? That'll give you wisdom. You start to see, wow, God is in line with what it says in the Bible. Okay, this stuff really happens. Okay? When you witness it, it really hits. That faith grows in you. You become stronger, stronger in your walk with God. Okay? And then verses 8 and 9. We'll go ahead and read verse 8 again here. And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. Okay. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made once, so he's focusing on that. Okay. Notice that, like I said before, it didn't change to wine until it was taken out and presented. So it was bared into the cup. Okay. Now what's interesting about that is, that means that, yes, when you're filling somebody else's cup, it turns to wine for them. That might lead to their salvation. But you're part of the process of turning that over and putting it in the cup. See that? And then all of a sudden, the water from you that's in you turns into wine as it's pouring down. Now, we discussed what wine meant. Okay, wine refers to gladness. Believe it or not, Christian, when you serve God, it gives you joy. Have you ever served God? Isn't it weird how you can get joy when people cuss at you? Isn't that interesting? Okay. okay you can only experience those kinds of things when you serve God, trust me. It's a, it's a blessing, and it's kind of shocking when it first happens, but you just, you know it in your heart, and it makes you want to serve God more. It makes you want to keep pouring those things out. Okay? You know, when we talk about exhorting the brethren to serve, it's amazing how if they just went out and served, God will do the exhorting for, for you. He'll save you the work. They, they don't understand. Okay, they haven't been part of God's plan, been part, one of those instruments that God used to move somebody to see him. Now, that's a great blessing. Nothing like it. Okay. And then for those Christians who don't understand why they don't have any joy in their lives, you ask them when's the last time you've been in church. Yeah. Well, what does that have to do with it? Well, if you're not serving God, how are you going to get any joy? That's how it works. 
Yeah. And that's right. You know, we're talking about how it works. A lot of a lot of lost people say, well, my religion works. Yeah, but it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not only does a Christian life work, it's also right. And when it works, it works eternally. That's your fruit. Your fruit is life everlasting, not corruption, the Bible says. Okay. There's a big difference there. And so if you're somebody who's saved and has kind of been backslid for a while and you're, you're away from God, I suggest you get back in the local church. Try to serve. Yes, your flesh isn't going to like it. doesn't matter. The one is in you is greater than what's in the world. Trust him and go out, and you will find that joy. Okay? You'll see God working in your life again if you're looking for that. Okay? And these servants, they knew. Praise God. And those are three of the four applications there. There's also one more. And just to end, I want to expose a few verses here, and then we'll, we'll end this evening. Uh, go back to verse 6. I want to discuss a couple things here. Uh, we were talking about what kind of wine this is. Let's think about this whole thing here in verse 6. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Okay? So, so what's a firkin? Okay, that's a unit of measurement. It's about 10 liters. Give you an idea. So each water pot had about 20 to 30 liters of this water. Okay? So if you got six water pots, you got 120 to 180 liters of this water that's turned into wine. Now let me ask you a question, okay? How much wine do you need to get trashed? Okay? That's way too much wine for a feast. And you're telling me this is alcoholic wine? You really think God did that? Oh, let me just put on the sin. Let me just roll it in there, okay? Really? Did you look at how much that's there? Well, I, I never thought about that. Yeah, no kidding. Okay? <laughs> look at that. We have to think, but people don't think. Okay, positive no. Okay? Now, that's a lot of wine, right? Now, let's say we go back to our type here. Notice that when God fills you, notice how much water he gives you. It's overflowing, right? When God gives you life, he gives you life and life more abundantly, the Bible says. See that? What a majestic amount. He'll just keep filling it. He'll just keep filling it. You'll keep overflowing. He'll keep filling it. He never runs out of water to give you. If you keep asking him, you want to drink some? Okay. Praise God. What a God. Give me to drink. Yeah, we should obey that command in John 4. Okay. We should take Psalm 23 and put it into action instead of using it just for funerals. Okay. I want my cup running over. I want people to see the goodness and mercy in God in my life so it can affect others. Okay. Another thing you can look at, we were talking about how those water pots are talking about people, right? Okay. It says two or three firkins apiece. Now, this is weird. Okay. We can play with the numbers and think about those. Okay. Because lost people, okay, their spirit is dead. They're missing a third of themselves. Okay. But saved people, they got all three. Okay. Let's play games here with the, with the numbers. But it's true. God will fill your water pot whether you're saved or lost. And he can turn them two, thir two firkins into three if you get saved, are you born again? Okay. Look at that. And both need that water. Both need the word of God. You don't stop needing the word of God just because you got saved. That's the beginning of your new life, not the end. Okay. It's not just about getting saved and that's it. Okay. If you, if you believe that, you've bought into the mega church lie. Congratulations, you're following the devil. Okay. You've given place to him. Okay. You need to live for God. Just as much as how he saved you. And you should want to do that because you're thankful for his sacrifice to you. For the resurrection that, we're, discussed, that we, we're celebrating today. We celebrate it all the time. Right? But that resurrection is a testimony to you that you are justified. Romans 4. See that? That's how you know. That's your proof, Christian. How do I know I'm saved? The Lord rose from the dead. That's who I'm trusting. Very simple. Okay? Go to verse 11. Discuss a few things here as well, and then we'll end. Verse 11. This beginning of miracles did Jesus. See that? Why is it the beginning of miracles? Because getting saved, salvation is the first miracle that God wants to do in your life. That's why. Amen. He may heal you. Amen. He may do that. If you ask him, you know, the Lord is merciful. He's willing to help lost people with those types of things. But the miracle that God wants to do to you, okay? It's to save you. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he can take, he can fill your water pot with water and turn it into wine. 
that wine of gladness. You see that? It was his first miracle here, and he wants it to be the first miracle in your life, in your Gospel of John, so to speak. See that? Okay. And it, it is. I mean, there's no greater miracle than salvation. You know that, right? Do you understand that? The new birth is supernatural. Okay? It's greater. It required God to roll up his sleeves, become a man for 33 years, choose to die for you, and then raise from the dead. Okay? The other miracles he just spoke. Did you read the Gospel of John? That didn't require much work from God. Creation, he spoke and it stood fast. That didn't require, that didn't require work. Okay? But salvation, the Lord really pulled up his sleeves here. Okay? He chose to be subject to men, to the devil for a moment. He did that voluntarily to save you. Think about that. Okay? And this is the first miracle he wants to bestow on every person on earth. Are you saved? Okay? I pray so. I beseech you to be so. Okay? It will change your eternity, not just your life. It's even bigger than that. Amen? Verse 11, last, last uh, phrase there. And manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. You see that? And no, this is what happens, Christian. If you start seeing God doing miracles in front of you, or you start seeing God working through you serving him, you start seeing God in these parts of your lives, it strengthens your faith, doesn't it? You start believing more and more in Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, when somebody brings some weird argument or, oh, well, you know, you don't have to believe the Bible. You have the entire Bible. That's not true. Or, oh, Jesus Christ is in God. You laugh that off because you've seen God working in your life. Okay. Nobody can shake your faith. That's how you get stronger. Okay? Faith does come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But faith also comes from living out the Christian walk. Romans 5. See that? Some things you can't learn from this. I'm just telling Pastor this one day. He doesn't understand that. I'm like, look, I learn from you, okay? You have experienced things that I need to go through. You've been through. I want to listen to you. I want to hear you. I want to apply these things so I run into those moments. I can make the right decisions and God can increase my faith. That way I can grow closer to where you are with God. See that? And the disciples here, in their life, when they were watching Jesus Christ work, they saw a miracle. And their faith increased because they were part of it. They were part of that action. They experienced it. See that? And God will do the same to you if you allow him to use you for his glory. See that? And so we'll continue uh, next week. Uh, more on this chat. Let's go ahead and pray and we'll open up for questions. Amen. Um, Heavenly Father, uh, thank you, Lord, for turning water into wine. And we just pray, Lord, that for those who are uh, here this morning who may not know you, Lord, that you work on their water pot, Lord, that you take the water that was provided to them by the servants here at the pulpit and also those who are talking to them on the side, Lord, and you take that water and you work it through their hearts, Lord, so they can be turned into wine and they can trust you for salvation. And Father, we give you thanks and praise for all things, especially the salvation that you've wrought in us, Lord, through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Man, I just want to say something. Yes, sir. You're talking about...